Last Sunday, the topic of divorce came up and I did not really expect it to happen. And that night and then the next day, I was really troubled by it. And as I began troubled, why was I troubled? I don't know, because it just kind of came out and I didn't know if it was left unfinished. I didn't really know what was going on. But at the more I prayed, I felt like the Lord wanted me not to bury the topic, but to exhume it. To unbury it, to pull it out, and and to put it out there, amen, in the atmosphere, which would be his word and his his church and his people. And, you know, the, anyone who has been divorced, because I can assure you that there's probably people in the house this morning that have been divorced. I would imagine that that is true. And every person that's been divorced has a unique story. Every story is unique. Meaning... You, you don't know exactly what has happened in the lives of the people that brought them to their place, right? I, I didn't mean to get too personal on this, but I will say this, that my mom and dad got a divorce. I guess I was about 13, I'm thinking. Um, I know my mom did the best that she knew that she could do. And back in the 80s, when my mom and dad got a divorce, divorce was not commonplace, at least not in the little world that I had been in back in the 80s. I'm talking about in the world in general. Like, I'm not talking about the church right now because we didn't even really understand the church the way that we understand the church today. We were born and raised Catholic, and it wasn't, now the Catholic church is against divorce. I'm not meaning to get into all this, but the point is this, is that it just wasn't common. And I can still remember whenever my mom came to talk to me. Now, I can assure you that we had quite the mess in the house. Whether mom was completely led by the Lord, I know this. She definitely did what she thought was best for the, for the children. And it wasn't just that they were arguing all the time. It was like dad was a mess. So I know that everybody's got a story is what I'm trying to say, right? And, and, and to be honest with you, I don't really expect the world to keep a covenant with a human being when the world isn't even in covenant with God. But the word of God says this, that in the, in the, whenever the truth of God is suppressed, that's what it says in Romans chapter 1, when the truth is suppressed and held down, that there's a spiraling of morality in society. It's a form of God's wrath. So whenever, if you suppress truth in your own life, like if Pastor Matt says something this morning and he brings the truth of God's word forth, and you reject the word, not Pastor Matt, you're not rejecting me. The Lord set me free. I'm not the one being rejected. Uh, whenever people reject it, they're rejecting his word. You might not like my personality. You might not like the way I say it. But if I'm saying the truth, quit looking at me and pay attention to what I'm saying and that will set you free. Amen. But let me, let me just say this. When the truth of God is suppressed, whether it's in your own personal life, whether it's in the church, whether it's in the world around us, Things happen because we're rejecting God's word. It's a shift in the atmosphere. We don't have to believe it. Oh, no, I'll get away with this. Well, no, you're not. You're not going to get away with it. I'm not going to get away with it. He's watching the whole thing. And one day it's coming down. And he's going he's gonna to be tallying up the events of our lives. So I don't expect the world to keep a covenant. But the scripture says that they cannot because they don't even have a covenant of God. The scripture says in Romans chapter 1 that with the spiraling of down, one of the things that happens is that people become covenant breakers. And I don't expect people that aren't in covenant with God to keep covenant. Amen. You know, all I'm going to say anymore about personal divorce, I think, is this, because that's not really what my message is on. People that are considering divorce, if you're in this place right now or you're on video watching and you're considering divorce, please seek the Lord. Humble yourself before God and get his heart on it first. Amen. That's all I'm asking as a man of God. Let me tell you why. I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures. Romans 14 and 12 says this. So that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. The second one is 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone must, may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done. Whether it be good or bad. We're all going to stand. Pastor Matt and all of his little stuff.
stuff that he got going on, the stuff you know about, the stuff you don't know about is going to stand before God and give an account for the things that he has done in the body. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for forgiveness. And thank you that when true repentance takes place, that sin from our past is washed under the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. The judgment seat of Christ is what Paul was talking about. And his awareness of that truth that one day Christians will stand before God and give an account. It motivates him. He's motivated by the knowing this truth. And he wants his readers to be motivated also. The Apostle Paul wants you and I to be motivated. God's grace to us in forgiving sin does not mean that he's careless about how Christians live their earthly lives. We will stand before him and we will be held accountable for our choices we made in this body. Now, I want to be I want to be clear in something because I feel the transition even in the way that I've been preaching in the last three weeks. It's not like I'm unaware. of it. I feel like what the Lord has been putting in my heart has been a message towards really for a while now about fearing and reverencing God. Not listen, fear and reverence towards God. Holiness. Okay, but this is not about legalism and sinless perfection. You need to understand that. There was only one that was sinless. But let me make a point. I'm not talking about living a life that's holy. Because look, the word of God says this. Be ye holy for I am holy. I'm not talking about you living holy for God in your own strength. No, no, no. I'm talking about you living for God in the strength of the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about you understanding what the gospel says, that the old you died and that a new you's been resurrected and you have access to the power of the Holy Spirit. And that as you yield to the truth of God's word, the Holy Spirit empowers you in order to live a life that is pleasing unto the Father. Amen. The word of God says that without righteousness, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And I understand that ultimately our righteousness and holiness is because we've been placed into Jesus and that when he looks at us, he sees the Lord. But again, he cares about the way we live our life. Amen. Amen. With that said, I'm really just using the thought of marriage and other relationships more like as a springboard to describe God's plan of doing a deeper work in the hearts and lives of his people. Our heart belongs to the Lord. It's the place where he lives. And I got to be honest with you, the Lord likes clean places. He really does. I mean, I, I a while back as I was praying and, you know, when the Lord was moving and our <clears throat> moving or still is moving in our services, I believe that. <clears throat> and, and we were thinking about the Holy Spirit. We were talking about the dove of the spirit, how the spirit of God is represented like a dove. And you imagine I told you all one one service. Imagine that it, there's a pure bird bath. It's got clean water and the dove is flitting around in the backyard and he sees that clean water and he lands in the water. And you know how the little birds throw water up with their beaks and they'll like bathe their little wings and there's water flying all over the place and they just look so happy because they're singing and because the dove the spirit of God loves a clean environment he he wants to move in the midst of our services and he wants to move in the midst of our lives and in the midst of our homes and many times listen to me church in our individual lives in our homes whenever it's not that clean you see what I'm getting at? And we bring all that. Up and then when the preacher's preaching, he's preaching to himself. Okay, so let's just take a deep breath and let us understand this message is for everybody. It's starting with the preacher. Okay, but, but listen, whenever that bird bath gets dirty, that bird ain't wanting to land in there. That, the Holy Spirit wants a clean place to abide, amen? And he wants to help us to make that place clean so that his spirit will have have the opportunity to move in our life, to lead us, to guide us, and to do the work that needs to be done in our life. So God wants to use relationships to do a work in our personal lives. The word long-suffering, I've taught that many times, comes out of Galatians 5. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And it's a fruit of the Spirit that is produced by the Holy Spirit. But the way that it happens is that it's learned through having patience with other people. It's a process that has to take place. Patience with other people in spite of their shortcomings, in spite of their wrongdoings in my life. And endurance in these relationships teaches me long-suffering. And long-suffering is the character of God. The alternative is divorce. Divorce from my wife, my husband, my children, my cousin, my workplace, my Christian brothers and sisters because they all aggravate and I'm done. I'm divorced. I'm done with you. Okay. Disunion. Separate. I'm moving on. Right? Okay. 
You get what I'm saying? Yeah, and so the scripture says that God is long suffering and he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All I can say is I thank God that he didn't divorce me whenever I was doing things that got on his nerves yeah. or offended him. Amen. And that he was long suffering towards me and he was merciful yes, yes. towards me. And then he came and he found me in all of his grace and his mercy and his love. He came and he found me in spite of the fact that the bird bath was full of mildew. In spite of the fact that the bird bath was polluted and it wasn't a place. But he yet, nevertheless, he knew that if I could just speak to him, if I could just get a hold of him, if I could just whisper and he'd listen and he'd yield to me, then I could do a work in his life. And I can bring restoration. Amen. Amen. You know, we really must seek God's wisdom regarding relationships. It's likely that there are times that we are trying to separate ourselves from people that we shouldn't while maintaining relationships we shouldn't. Right? Yeah. The beauty is that the spirit in us will lead and guide us in all truth. And always, and I mean always, he will be consistent with his word. Let me say that again. The spirit in us will lead us and guide us in all truth. The spirit in you, if you are saved this morning, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have invited Jesus into your heart and asked forgiveness of your sin, if you haven't, you should really do that right now. You should stop everything. Close your eyes and say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I accept your sacrifice for my sin. I believe you rose from the dead. Come into my heart and save me. Forgive me, Lord. And if you've done that, that means the Holy Spirit, if you meant it from your heart, the Holy Spirit moves into your heart. And you know when he's moved into your heart because you're not the same as you That's used right. to be. That's right. Because now it's the Holy Spirit in you and he's starting to speak to you. Now we're going to get into this. It's getting a lot, going to get a lot deeper before it gets more simple. But the Holy Spirit is going to help us to understand what he wants us to understand. Amen. So the beauty is that the spirit in us will lead us and guide us in all truth. Not Pastor Matt. Pastor Matt can't lead you and guide you in all truth. He can speak truth to you, but it's the spirit in you that's going to bear witness with his spirit that what's spoken is true. Amen. Amen. And he's always consistent with his word. He will never transgress his own word. God will not do that. Amen. You might. I might, but he will not do that. In Ephesians 5, Paul uses marriage between a man and a woman as an illustration of the relationship between Jesus and his bride. Can you go ahead and put up there Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 21? We're going to look at some of these scriptures a little more closely together. I want you to see Ephesians 5 and 21. This is another scripture that people... Uh, in today's, not this one, but the next one, people have a little hard time with it. But look what it says. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, look, if you look in the Greek text, I'm just going to tell you the word is phobo Christu. So really what it phobo, phobia, fear, right? Fear, not of, not of theos, which is God, but fear of Christ. So the idea is a, as a reverence to Christ, submit yourselves one to another. All right. Now look at the next verse. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, I want you to think about these two scriptures real quick because the word submit was placed in both of them. In, the, in verse 21, it says, submit yourselves one to another. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Ephesian church. Is he, he's talking to you and I. He's talking to people that are believers. And he's saying, to you and I, we are to submit ourselves one to another. Now, someone, read, now what does that word mean? It means to make oneself subordinate under another. Yeah. Now, somebody recently sent me a video, and it's not important who it is. I mean, it was a crazy video. I ended up watching it, by the way. And the pastor, I'm about to tell you all this, told everybody to go outside and eat grass. Dude, these people went outside and they were literally, and I know it wasn't fake. I believe it was real. They were literally eating grass. If, if, if that'll never happen, right? But, but, but so we're not even talking about that type of submission, but the idea is, is that you subordinate yourself under another. I was trying to think of a good illustration, but there might be, okay, so for instance, there might be a situation that you have a particular problem with something that I did whenever we were having a relationship. We, like in other words, in our friendship, in our 
brother and sister relationship. We might have even been outside in the parking lot or something talking. And I might have said something to you and it might have offended you. That's a possibility. I mean, I don't think that I would do it on purpose, but it's a possibility, right? And so let's say I offended you and then you want to come and you want to come talk to me. Okay, and this happens all the time in people's houses and their families, yeah. between relationships and their children, right? And, and so, and you want to come talk to me, and I can have one attitude where I'm like, dude, please, you're wasting my time, right? Could I not be like that? And or some people like that? And take Pastor Matt and admit he's been like that? Oh, I ain't got time for you, man. Don't you know I'm important? I got to go study. I got a message I got to preach tomorrow. Or I can truly humble myself and in a sense submit myself to you as my brother or sister in the Lord and allow you the opportunity to speak to me so that we can clarify this situation and get it rectified. Does that make sense? So we're to submit one to another and wives are submit themselves to their own husband. But in both of those cases, in the first one, it says submit yourself one to another as through fear of Christ. And in the other one, submit wives to your husband as unto the Lord. So in reality, whenever I submit myself to you or you submit yourself to me or a wife submits herself to her husband, then neither one of us are submitting ourselves really to each other. We're submitting ourselves to Christ and we're submitting ourselves to God because it's his word and he instructed us to do it. And when we do it and we follow his instruction, there's a great blessing that awaits us. But if we allow our heart to become rebellious and hardened by the world around us and says, I ain't submitting to no man and I ain't submitting to to whatever the case, then okay, you got a free will. You're, you're allowed to make that choice. Yep. But if things don't turn out for you, don't get mad at God. Yep. Amen. All right. Amen. Submission requires meekness. Let me give you a few scriptures that says, Jesus said in Matthew 11, 29, take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Ephesians 4 and 2 says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Colossians says this, put on therefore as the elect of God. That's you. Do you know that, that word elect? It's a cool word in the Greek. Is eklektos. The word ek means out. Lektos is like an election. You were elected out. You were pulled out. Pulled out of what? Pulled out of the world. Or, or you haven't been pulled out of the world. Are you still part of the world? You know, hopefully not. Hopefully not. We're not still part of the world. Because the world's perishing. But those of us that have been pulled out of the world and put into Christ, amen, are come alive and have been pulled out of the world. That's what you've been pulled out of. That's what you've been chosen out of. Amen. It says that... For the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Boy, isn't that important, huh? I mean, I mean, think about it, how we can get irritated with one another, we get into a quarrel, we get frustrated, and sometimes we hold on to those things. Whether it's in a true marriage, whether it's with our kids, whether it's with you or me, right? But in reality, Jesus forgave you and I, and the Word of God is telling us to forgive another. Now, I don't know about you, but the word meek kind of sounds a little too much like weak. Meek and weak, they rhyme. You could probably bust a rhyme on that, right? Meek and weak, you could do it. I'm not going to do it, but you could. And, but the word meek, one, one de definition of the Greek word for meek, it's not in what you'll find in Strong's, but it's translated strength under control. You remember whenever they went to go get Jesus in the garden, what he said? He said, do you not know that I could call 12 legions of angels? That's a lot of angels. A legion is about 7,000. If you multiply 7,000 by 12, I'm not real good doing math on the fly, but it's somewhere like around 180,000 or something like that. Something like that. Can you imagine 180,000 angels? That's like a big deal. That's a lot of power. It really only takes one to wipe out that little collection of men that were coming to get Jesus. But you get the point. 
Strength under control. In ancient Greece, war horses were trained to be meek. Strong and powerful, yet under control and willing to submit. Think about that. Think about a war horse that's been trained to run straight into the battle. He's, he's, got, a, he's got a controlling command telling him what to do. Now, now think about the opposite of that. Think about a, a, a stallion that's, that's a, now all, all these horses are pretty, right? They're big, they're, they're muscular. In, in the sun, their muscles would probably glisten. Could you imagine, could you, but have you, you imagine a stallion that's in a show or one that's just in a, in a corral like that and he's just over there prancing like that. And he knows, he, he knows he's strong. He knows he's he, he, he is just in his nature. He knows it. And, and he, but, but, but you know, that's not meekness right there. That's more kind of like, like this level of pride. He's not even really functioning the way he's supposed to because he's just like over there prancing around, looking all pretty, all of his strength being wasted. But this war horse has, has learned the, the process of meekness that even though there's great power in him, he learns how to submit that power so that he can be, so that he can function for God. Amen. And, and, and in reality, that's what we need to understand, that in Christ, there's a process of learning meekness, of being like Jesus, because Jesus says, I am meek. Come unto me, you who are weary laden. I will give you rest, for I am meek and I am lowly of heart. Going back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it says this. And husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Let me read that again. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He gave himself for it. What do you, what do you reckon that means when he says he gave himself for it? He died for it. He died. So it's sacrificial. Jesus sacrificed his life for his bride. Amen. It, it, he served. There's a scripture in the New Testament where Jesus said, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life as a ransom for men. So the role of the husband in the, in the marriage is to love his wife sacrificially and to serve his wife. And in reality, that's really the body of Christ. A person that's going to truly serve God and have the heart of Jesus is going to have to understand that it's not really about you. It's not about me. It's not even a little bit about us. Everything is about him. Amen. And that is the true process of Christianity. Like John the Baptist said that I would decrease so that he might increase. The word of God teaches that you who were born of Adam, and we'll get into that a little bit more. And so if you're not, if you're saved this morning, then the Bible says this, that you've been crucified with Christ. Your old man that was born like Adam has been crucified in Christ and a new man has been resurrected to newness of life. Now it takes time for that new man to start acting like a new man and not revert back to old behavior. All right. But anyway, he was sacrificial. He served. The son of man came to serve. Amen? Amen. In verse 29, it says, for no man ever hated his own. I'm talking about Ephesians 5 and 29 it says no man ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord of the church. Now, I got to tell you that. <laughs> You don't want to know all my past. I, I've been a mess. I've been full of anger. And sometimes my anger went past verbal. At times. But, I, but what the scripture says is that the man with his own flesh, his own flesh, I'm talking about my flesh. A normal man when he's operating properly is not going to harm his own flesh. Now, if the enemy gets a hold of you, he's going to try to destroy your flesh. But that's not you doing that. That's the enemy trying to force you to do that. So it's not God's will for us to harm ourselves. And in natural circumstances, if a man's operating even logically, he's not going to harm his own flesh. 
Okay, instead what he does is he protects it and he nourishes it. I thought of an illustration back when I used to really be into working out. You know, you watch some of these videos and these people do these food preps. You ever seen that? And they're like, they got, I got, this is my, my morning thing that I eat. This is my pre-workout meal. This is my post-workout snack. And you get the point. Like they got about seven different containers. Look, this is my post-workout snack. I got some quinoa that's got some extra protein in it. And I also got some feta cheese for some slow-release protein. And I put some dried cranberries in there to increase my insulin, to open up the cell, to let all these nutrients flood in after I get my swole on. I mean, look, they got it down to the science, man. And, and, and they're nourishing their flesh. They're nourishing their body. They're taking care of themselves because they cherish it and they want to protect it. And what the Word of God says is this, is that a man with his wife is going to nourish and protect her. But remember, this is an illustration of what Jesus does with his church. He says, for, look at this. I, I've never completely seen this exactly like this before. And I'm going to try to open it up a little bit more. Look what it says. For we are members of his body. So now he's transitioning, right? He went from the husband and how he's going to treat his wife. And he says, even as the Lord does the church. But then he says, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We, so, so just as the two have become one flesh, you and I in Christ have become one with him. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. But many times a man's family tries to needle themselves and get themselves all up involved in the man's life. The scripture says right here, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Sometimes that man's family needs, and the man needs to stand up and to say, hey, hold on a second. And you ain't got to do it like I just did it and hurt my knuckles on my forehead. You don't have to do it that way. It can come through a spirit of humility. It can come from a spirit of meekness, but it can, it can come nonetheless. And it can say, no, when I'm ready, I'll come to do that. And no, you're not going to tell me what to do because... I'm the Lord's servant, and we're going to hear from the Holy Spirit as men and women of God, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us, not another human being that might be coming in and causing division and strife in the midst of our family. you got to understand that the enemy works and uses other human beings and tries to come in and to cause confusion and strife in people's lives. Because, see, again, even though my message isn't about divorce and a marriage, kind of, sort of, the enemy loves nothing more than to destroy the family unit. Yeah. He wants to destroy the family unit. Yes. All right. And so, anyway, with that said, going to verse 30. Well, I said it. I've never seen it like this before. We are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. Verse 31 says this. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined to his wife, the two shall be one flesh. So, you know, I want you to think about this. I've had conversations with people before, and they're like, I just don't feel like I'm one flesh. I, I get that. Like, can you raise your hand? Can, I mean, can we, like, in other words, are you, raise your hand if you're married. I just want to see if you're married. Just, yes. Okay, so we got several people in here that are married. All right. Now I want you to raise your hand if you, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. That would be inappropriate. I'm going to ask you to think in your mind, do I really feel like I am truly one flesh with my spouse? All right, that says an illustration. Because what I wrote here, I said, husband and wife are so different to start with, right? When we first come together, we're, we're so different. And we don't realize how different we are until we come together, right? And then now we're living under the same roof, sleeping in the same bed. Or, you know, that's theoretically what happens. And, and now we realize how different we really are. And these cultures come together and they clash. And so as his bride, we are so different than him in the beginning of our relationship. Does that not make sense? When we first come to Christ, when we first get saved, we want, we love God. When we truly get saved, the spirit of God comes to live on the inside of us. He starts to change us. But we're really a whole lot different than he is. Yeah. You know what I'm getting at? Have you read the word of God? Because if you've read the word of God, you have to realize, wow, I don't really look like that. As much as what I should. At least that's what I get out of it when I read it. Amen. And as soon as I think that I'm starting to look more like the word of God, the Lord shows me this. Right? And he's like, hold on, big boy. <laughs> okay. 
So in the beginning of our relationship, so individual Christianity starts with a biblical truth. Faith in Christ kills the old man, that's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, and resurrects a new man. But that's just the ceremony. That's the ceremony, and you could call it the consummation night if you want. You can ask your parents later what that means. But that's just the ceremony and the consummation. But now the one flesh begins. Now the coming together as one flesh begins after we've given our life to Christ. Because you see, look, this is what the scripture says. You got to just take my word on it until you read it for yourself. But the word of God says this, that you're not your own. If you're truly a Christian, you're no longer your own. You've been bought with a price. What kind of price was paid for? The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus was the redemption price that purchased you and I, according to the way of what we read in the Greek, off the slave market of sin. Jesus' blood was the currency that purchased us. We no longer belong to ourselves. So now it's a process of learning this. And we can fight against it like a stallion with a bit in his mouth. Pull our head away. Right? Lord knows that the Apostle Paul, whenever the Lord struck him, struck him down with the light, he was on the way to Damascus to have Christians killed. And the, and the Holy Spirit struck him and blinded him. And he said, Saul, Saul, that was before his name was changed to Paul, why do you kick against the pricks? Some translations say goads. It was like a sharp stick. Nowadays they have electric cattle prods, right? It was a sharp stick that they'd stick in the hind quarters of an animal. Boom, hit them in the backside to try to get them to move in the right direction. And the Holy Spirit was saying to, to what Jesus was saying to Paul, why do you kick against the goads? It's like I'm over here trying to get you to move in the right direction. I'm over here trying to stick in the hind quarters to move you in the right spot. But you keep kicking against it. He says, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. I'm the one you've been persecuting. And so many times in our life and in our law, we go against the will of God and the word of God. And we don't understand why everything is so full of calamity. Everything is so full of chaos. And we want it to stop. But it's not going to stop till we stop. Until we surrender to the will of God. Amen. And that, that will set you free, my friend. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. He doesn't have his own personal flesh here anymore. Well, except that's not exactly true because we are here. I'm talking about Jesus and we are his body. And if we are truly saved, his spirit is in us. Amen. According to 1 Corinthians 6 and 17, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So we are one with him in spirit. Now let me ask you a question. This is when I think it's about to get good, but I like this kind of stuff. You may not. I like to have to think. We are one with him in spirit, but does our mind think like him? Does our body or our flesh act like him? So if you're saved this morning, I want you to know what the word of God says. The word of God says you have been made one in your spirit with the Holy Spirit. You are regenerated, the Bible says. You are recreated, the Bible says. The old man that was born in Adam has been crucified and buried with Jesus, laid in a tomb according to the way the Father sees it, and a new man has been resurrected to newness of life, and the Holy Spirit has been deposited within your spirit, and you have been made one with the Holy One of Israel. That's the word of God. Yeah, and if we could get our mind to believe that, yes. then our flesh, our body, <laughs> may start moving in that direction. Now, I want to explain a little bit about the word flesh just real quick. First off, there's many times that the word flesh is describing just a natural part of man, like meaning this flesh. Like it's, it, you're, you, you understand that man is made up of spirit, soul, and, and flesh. So whenever we're just talking about flesh, sometimes the idea is just your external terrestrial body. Can I say it like that? Is that getting too weird to you? Terrestrial means earthly. You have an earthly body, but you are a spirit being. That's why it's very important that you understand that when you die, your spirit is going to be released somewhere. Your spirit is eternal. Y'all aren't hearing me. Listen to me. Your spirit is eternal. When you die, your spirit is going to be released 
somewhere. Amen. If you have not received Jesus' sacrifice for your sin, your spirit is going to be eternally released into a place called hell that was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was not prepared for you, but whenever the word of God went forth, in your presence, and you rejected it, you now will have to spend an eternity in a devil's hell that Jesus preached saying, the worm doesn't die, the fire isn't quenched, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus preached it. It's a real place. Yeah. It's not going to be a party. It's not going to be smoking bones and giving fist bumps, baby. It's real. Amen. Yes. It's real. Yes. And there's not going to be any talk. There is no purgatory. Your mom and your daddy can't pray you out. You either receive Jesus on the front end or you will spend eternity. That's the word of God. I'm either a liar because I'm telling you a, a liar, I'm telling you the truth because it comes straight out of the heart. Okay. All right, now you can go back to doing what you want. <laughs> Hallelujah. Does our mind think like him? Does our flesh act like him? Yeah. What causes the body to move? I would say it's the mind, right? The mind causes the body to function. What... What is the helm that drives the mind? I could be wrong on this, but Captain Bill. A helm is anything connected to the steering operation. Even according to one definition, even a human being could be considered part of the helm. But that's the direction of the ship, right? The helm has something to do with the steering of the ship. What is the helm of the body? So the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. The mind tells the body where to go. The will, though, could, is it not possible that your mind could say, I don't want to go there? Yes. But then your will, yes. is it possible for your will to supersede your mind yes. and, to go, and to push yes. you to go there? Yes. Has that ever happened to you before? Yes. I want to do the right thing in my mind. I believe this is the right thing. But my will supersedes it. So if we're, we're going to stick with the captain of a ship, and I only remember starboard because it has two R's in it, and it's the right, I think, and the port is the left. I got to turn this thing starboard. So I'm the captain. My mind says I got to, whatever, however I adjust this thing, and the vessel goes to the left. Somebody in the open ocean could just be kind of making a little bit of a, just floating through. As the helm tells the boat, the vessel, which way to go, so it goes. It could go in a place of peace and tranquility, or it could find itself, even though it knows that there's rock, a rock jetty up ahead, it could drive itself straight into the rocks if that's what it chose to do. <clears throat> so I want you to understand the difference between the mind and the will. And listen, last part, I'm not even talking about it, the emotions of the soul. Most of the time our emotions are so jacked up because we're going to live in our life according to our own will. Amen. We're living our life according to our own will. Come on, somebody, help me out here. I'm over here scrolling TikTok, baby. Let me go and see what they say about transgenders today. Oh, look at this girl's groovy outfit. Oh, look at this. Look at that. Oh, yeah, let me fill my mind with some of this garbage that's out there and I wonder why my life is in shell. I wonder why I'm so, I hang out with people that sit there and clown me all day long. They sit there and they beat me down. They talk about, oh, look at your eyelashes, girl. Oh, look, dude, what's wrong with your pants? What about your blue jeans? Look like your mama ain't washed your blue jeans in about two weeks. I grew up in that atmosphere, man. Kids ain't no different today than what they used to be. I was the bully. I know that stuff's still a lot. And we got to sit there and let them these people speak into our life because they supposedly cool. Ain't nothing cool about that. That's Satan. That's a liar. He's a liar. The father of lies. He's trying to destroy you. Don't listen to that. Oh, I wish some kid up in here would get the bowl.
boldness of the Lord up in his belly. I, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus is what he'd say on that playground. Hallelujah. I remember one time Danielle told me that. Danielle said she was in the eighth grade and they were playing softball at school and she, she wasn't an athlete. She couldn't play no ball. <laughs> and she said that there was a girl on the team that was kind of like me. And she's like, I know that girl could have stomped me good. And to hit the ball, and this girl just lets the ball roll between her legs. She's like, mm, I ain't have nothing to do with that ball. That girl got so mad. Girl! It started like walking towards her. See, she said at the last second, I didn't have no other choice. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I just did it. I rebuked you in the name of Jesus. She said it worked on a dog one time that was chasing me and barking. That dog turned around and went, er, 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 and went running off. She said, I'll tell it to you too. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. She said, well, I'm a Christian. Well, then act like it. <laughs> Hallelujah. I wish some kid up in here would get the boldness to not be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Because like the song said, there is power in the name of Jesus. I wish I could say to that same for you. To break every chain. Break every chain. I believe that, church. I believe there's power. I'm so glad that he found me sitting on that dumb air conditioner waiting for somebody to come get me high. A loser, a high school dropout. I'm so glad that the Lord rolled up on me and changed my life. I'll ever give him glory. I'll ever magnify him. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to them which believe. Could we say that the will of man is like the helm of a ship sailing on the sea and wherever the helm pulls the rudder and that direction she goes. Father, not my will, but your will be done. Words of our master, Jesus. Yes. Then he said this, let my kingdom come, let my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is that what he said? I <laughs> pulled the Solomon on me. That's not what he said. He said, Father in heaven, let your kingdom come. Let your will be yeah. done on earth as it is in heaven. Not your will, not my will, his will. His will. What's his will, preacher? Well, that's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> it's this right here. It's a lifelong endeavor of learning his will. Amen? Amen. We might can say that we are married to God through salvation. Amen? And we can definitely say that our spirit is one with his if we are born again. But our mind and our will needs a whole lot of cross work done to our old man and a whole lot of resurrection power for our new man. And the more we in our will dies, the more he and his will lives. That makes sense? Yes. The more my will dies, the more his will is able to live. So I'll put it in here so why don't I act like him? I mean, I'm just saying, you know. I had a bunch of other stuff in there, but I took it out. Okay, well, I'm just good. I have one. I can hear somebody screaming in the back of the crowd. Well, I do act like him. And then he looks over at his friend and he whispers at least, yeah, whatever, because I'm, I'm led by the spirit. And I mean, praise God, hopefully we are. So I'm not trying to, and, and, that, and that's the whole plan, right? Is that we would be led by the spirit. But then I had in here, okay, well then why did you say what you said yesterday? Why did you go where you went? Why did you do what you did? Right. Now, to be fair, some people are like, well, preacher, you know, you weren't following me around. And to be fair, somebody might have had, they might have got a baby. You got a baby? Yeah. You got a young one? Maybe so. You got a baby? Maybe the baby without a milk. Maybe Yvette was stressed because she needed to feed the baby, right? And maybe her husbandman said, oh, baby, I'll go get that milk for you. I got that for you, amen? And maybe he got into the vehicle and he obeyed all the traffic laws on the way to Walmart. And he went into Walmart. And as he's just skipping through the aisle and he grabs the right can of milk and he sees somebody right there in need, he lays hands on that brother or sister in the Lord. Hallelujah. He follows all the traffic laws going home. And here you go, baby. Here's the milk. You get the point. I know that we're not living a perfect life. But the point is, is to be led by the Spirit. Amen. Amen. And many times our behavior 
doesn't look like the behavior of Jesus. That's the main point I'm trying to get across. This is when it gets a little bit deep. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. It's only 11, 10. Y'all, have y'all been in church for two hours already? <laughs> you gotta hustle up, dude. All right. So I wanna give you, I wanna give you a couple of, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna write some Greek. Aren't y'all happy y'all came to church today to learn Greek? Sukikos. Hey, look at this word. I like this word here. Uh, let's see. How's that go? Something like this. New. I think this is how it's spelled. I could be wrong. If you look it up, I'm wrong. Pneumaticos. I think this is it. It's actually Omega. Pneumaticos. And then the last one is Sarkikos. Anybody ever been in an oil field before? Yeah? Um, y'all remember, y'all heard the word pneumatics before? Oh, yeah. Pneumatics? Yeah. Air. So y'all seen machinery that operates off of pneumatics? Air. Air. Pneuma. Wind. Spirit of God. That's where we get the word pneumonia. Pneumatics. The power of air. Huh? Isn't that good? Pneumaticos. All right. So let's look at this right here in first. Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 because I want to talk to you what we're talking about right now is why don't I act like him <laughs> you know why don't you just say well Pastor Matt why don't you act like him that's a good question let's try to figure it out 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 says but the natural man, see, times in past, I believe that I was teaching this wrong because I said that this was the person before salvation, but in reality, this can be a Christian too. Verse 14, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Sukikas. If you were going to spell this word right here, suke is spelled a little bit different. It's going to be spelled like this. Suke. If you spelt it in English, it would be spelt like this. Many of y'all are already aware, aware. And if you added this to it, because they don't have a Y in Greek, psyche. So your soul is 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 part of is your mind, your will, and your emotion. Right. It's where they created the whole science called psychology based off of that. I don't call it psychology, I call it psychology because it's your soul. So the natural man, the soulish man, does not understand. The things of God because they're spiritually discerned. So you can be a born again Christian and still operating from your mind instead of allowing the spirit to have the lead. And you can think that your mind is right because you formulated an opinion about something. And it's not really the spirit of God. But you're convinced because you are a man or woman of God. Hallelujah. And you are a spiritual creature and you got the wrong mindset because you ain't me. You prancing around in your karate. <laughs> and pride will convince you that your mind is right when in reality that's not really what the Spirit's saying. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Yeah. I hope that makes sense. So it says in verse 14, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But look at the next verse, verse 15. But he that is spiritual, pneumaticos, the spiritual man, the soulish man, sukikas, the spiritual man, pneumaticos. I love that concept of pneumatics. The air, let me ask you one more question. I don't mean to be weird, but Whenever they steer a boat back in the day, were those was the steering mechanism driven by air some kind of way? Because sometimes it sounded like air would like whenever they turned the little thing. When I know you don't remember, I, I don't know. But whenever there was a time that I was on a yes. boat one time, huh? Yes. yes, I was on a boat one time laid up because I was seasick with the captain, and he let, I guess he let me stay up in there, and I could hear when he would turn it. It was like it would like release air. And it was sending, the, sending, I guess, some kind of puff of air down there to make the, somehow it was working like that. 
But I just want to make the point is that there's power in the air. And in this case, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. And that the believer that learns how to submit himself to the will of God. Now, the Spirit of God is the one that's leading, guiding. The Spirit of God is now the one that is energizing and empowering. It's no longer his own mindset and his own will that's leading the way. It's the Holy Spirit that's leading the way. You and I need to learn how to move out of the way and let the Holy Spirit speak. Amen. And the Holy Spirit speaks what's said in this book. Amen. So then he goes on to say this. He that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Now look at verse, chapter 3, verse 1. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Sarkikos comes from the word sarks, S-A-R-X, if you were going to spell it in English, which means flesh. And sometimes flesh doesn't mean natural body. Sometimes flesh means the sinful nature. And can a person go from operating in their mind, bypassing the Holy Spirit, and go into the flesh? Absolutely. Because you see, it goes on to say it right here. He says, I have fed you, verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. meat. For hitherto... You were not able to bear it. Up until this point, you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able, for you are yet carnal. Sarks, where we get the word in Spanish, carne asada, meat, flesh. You're carnal, for whereas is among you envying, strife, and divisions, are you not carnal? So you and I are born again and you and I have the spirit. We've been made one with the spirit and the spirit in us wants to lead and guide. He wants to be the pneumatic system. He wants to be the, the power behind us. He wants to be the one that, that tells the boat where to go. And there's a possibility that our own mind, our sukikos man, our psychological man, our mind can get in the way of what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And if we're not careful, it may turn back into the sarkikos man where our flesh gets in the way and the sinful nature gets riled up again. And the next thing you know, we're causing division, <coughs> confusion, yeah. disunity, whether it's in the house or possibly even in the house of God. I don't know about you, but I don't want nothing else telling me where to go other than the Lord. Amen. I don't want Matt Abraham telling me where to go. Amen. And I sure don't want no other entity telling me where to go. Right? Amen. Romans 8, 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The letter to the Corinthian church says, For who has known the mind of God? I just read it to you. But we have the mind of Christ. Family describes closeness. Amen? Israel was broken down into families, clans, tribes, and a nation, and the church is a larger whole, whole made up of smaller bodies, and within the body, there's individuals that make up the body, right? But the bodies are supposed to be his body, and there's nothing like the closeness of a family unit. In the church setting, there will be things that will happen that will frustrate the believer, and Satan will convince them that they need to leave. And sometimes it is time to go. I get that. I've left. I was in one church for 13 years. I was in another church for 10 years. And when it got time to go, it was time to go. But many times people leave churches way before they're supposed to. And many times people just hopping and popping here and there. And they're not really getting rooted and grounded. That's between them and the Holy Spirit. God wants to do something on the inside of us. And what he does is he places us in an environment when he, where he can put his finger on some things in our life that he wants to deal with. That's uncomfortable. Could you imagine somebody walking up to you? I'm not going to do it because there's nobody. Else. Well, I'm going to go to show. Hey, buddy. What's going on right here? Isn't that irritating? Sorry, dude. I love you, man. Put the, put the finger on some stuff. What is this? What am I like? Here. And that's what the Lord does. He wants to put us in a place where he can show us some things that he can deal with. Because he wants to grow us up. Amen. A real church, I believe, provides an atmosphere, an opportunity where closeness of relationships can take place. 
Now, some people don't like that. But it's not supposed to be a place where we get so close to one another, we start talking about each other behind our back and gossiping and slandering and causing division and malice and all this other kind of garbage. That's lust of the flesh. That's the sinful nature. Let that stuff die. Amen? Amen. Amen. But there isn't a more intimate relationship than husband and wife. They are one flesh, and what man will harm his own flesh? Think about that. Who would tear his own flesh apart? <laughs> Jesus allowed his flesh to be torn, but his body was torn so that ours could be healed. His flesh was ripped like the veil so that we could gain access into his presence. That's Hebrews chapter 10 verse 20. Jesus tore his flesh so that his bride could be brought closer to him, not to put her away. These relationships that we have in marriage with our children... And in a genuine church setting, they cause a closeness that God uses to expose things in us. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 14. You can put that up there for me, Sandy, if you don't mind. Look what the scripture says right here. And this is where I'm going to probably need you here in a second, Jace, but I'm going to holler at you. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Wow. To be, to be led by the Spirit of God means you're a son of God. Not led by your soul. Not led by your flesh. Right? But look at that verse in verse 13. If you, if you, if ye, if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. You, if you, through the Spirit, mortify. Well, what, what does it mean to mortify? I mean, it sounds like mortician, right? You know what a mortician is? They deal with dead bodies. It's not the dealing with a dead body. It's putting up the body to death. So if you, through the Spirit, Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body. All right, Jace, I need you to come up here. So I don't know anything about games. I'm not a gamer. Never played a game. <laughs> Listen, I'm not going to beat up games. I'm not. I, I did that last week. But this is what I'm going to say. Thank you, man. You're an awesome dude. I, love I really do love this. So look, my, the, one, the game that I used to know how to play was an Atari little football game, and my mama bought me Pong. <laughs> Paul, hey dude, that's ridiculous. All right. So I asked Jace, because I, I, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner, so I got kids coming in all the time. I'm like, what's your hobby? I'm a gamer, dude. All right. So I'm like, okay, explain your game to me. So they got a couple of games, and I learned, so I asked questions, and I tried to engage these kids, so maybe I can get Jesus in there some kind of way. And so I'm talking to them, and there's one game called Fortnite, right? And, and I'm like, okay, explain to me Fortnite. And so whenever they say, I'm like, okay, so you're behind the shooter and you're telling the shooter where to go. Something like that. Is that right? Does that seem right? Okay. And then there's another game I think I asked in Call of Duty, right? And in Call of Duty, I think all you see is the gun right here. So like you're actually the shooter. So it's like you're looking at everything through your own eyes. Whereas with Fortnite, you're, you're behind the guy and you're telling the other guy where to go. Okay. Versus you actually tuck the gun and you just go where you want to go. So there's a little bit of a difference, right? So what I want you to see with the scripture right here is it says, if you, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body. Now, this is an illustration, so if it's not perfect, then, you know, you got you to cut me some slack here, Jack, okay? So we're going to pretend that you're the Holy Spirit, all right? And you're going to just stand so that everybody on the camera can see us. And I am Matt. And I've invited the Holy Spirit into my gaming world. I've invited the Holy Spirit into my reality, into me, into Matt's heart. Like the psalmist said, search my heart, O God, and try my reins. Yes. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to get on the inside and to look, take a look around at my innards. And I'm asking you to do a search and destroy mission. Yes. So here we go. Right there. Come to the right. Right there. To the right. To the right. Lost. Right there. Get it. Shoot it. Shoot lost. It's in me. Get it out, Lord. Look at it. To the left. Right over here by the light. Look at that. Anger. Look, look, look 
straight ahead right there, Lord. I know it's been in there jealousy. Over there, if it was the door. Oh, there it is. Boom. Go ahead, take it out. Oh, it's lost. It's so ugly. Come. Look over here. Greed. Oh, I can't ever get it out, Father. Get rid of it, Lord. All right. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. See, it's you through the Spirit. I know somebody wanted the Spirit behind the man. Okay, we could have done it that way too. The point is, is this. The voice is active in the verb. It's an active verb. What does it mean? The action, the, the subject has a part to do with the action. If you, through the Spirit, put to death, that means he's not just waiting. It's not the, the verb isn't passive. What does passive mean? <clears throat> in a passive voice in the Greek language, it means that the subject is passive and he's being acted upon. And it'd be kind of like this. I know it looks silly, but I'm trying to. Okay, Lord, do your work. I'm over here waiting. I got my legs crossed. Yeah. Okay, Lord, come on. Do the work that I need you to do in my heart, oh right. Lord. No. If you, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body. Well, what is the deeds of the body? Well, I don't know. Did your feet bring you to the wrong place? Did your hands pick up the wrong stuff? Did your mouth say the wrong thing? Did your fingers tune to the wrong frequency? Did your ears pick up the wrong frequency? Did your eyes look on the wrong thing? If you, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body, what does it say? You shall live. Hallelujah. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Oh, that's so good. Because listen, it ain't even done yet. Yeah, give him praise. He's worthy. But look at this. Can see the spirit sometimes and he's so merciful because you can even before you get this word in you and listen to me child of God people in this church you need to understand you got to get this word in you yeah. people watching on video you got to get this word in you but until you do I want to tell you something this is not a cop out this is just reality he's so merciful he will speak to you That's right. once you're born again and the Holy Spirit lives in your heart he will speak to you that voice is, comes in a whisper <clears throat> And he will whisper to you. And he will say, put it down. Come on. Put it away. Yes. Put it down, put it away, get it out. Yes. What are you talking about, preacher? You don't need me to enter into this right here, buddy. That's your blank to fill in. Amen. Put it down. Yes. Put it away. Turn it off. Yes. Whatever it is, he's going to whisper it to you. Yes. Hallelujah. And those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. But in order to walk in chapter 8, one has to be crucified in chapter 6. Let's put this scripture up there real quick. We're almost done. Hang with me. We're about to get the musicians up here. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 7 says this. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, you might not know this, but when you got saved... What the Bible's talking about right here is not water baptism. By the way, if you need to be water baptized, you need to get with me so that we can plan one because I got my friend in home that wants to be baptized. So you, if you need to be water baptized, then we can we can set we can arrange this, amen, before it gets cold. We don't only have to have one baptismal service. We can have multiple baptismal services, but you should be baptized. But with this scripture right here, it's not even talking about water baptism. It's talking about spiritual baptism. It's talking about when you put your faith in Christ. Did you put your faith in Christ? I know I'm losing you, so I'm going to go ahead and do another little, little illustration so that I can try to keep you away. This is, a, what is this? This is a tombstone. See, the first time you were born, you were born like Adam, and that's your old man. And then somebody told you the good news of Jesus Christ, and you said yes to Jesus. Did you say yes to Jesus yet? If you said yes to Jesus, congratulations, brother or sister. You're saved. Hallelujah. You're born again. And you should know it because the Spirit of God lives in you. If you have not been saved, praise God. Call on the name of Jesus. Amen. So look, here you are. You were born the first time when you came forth in from your mother's womb. You probably don't remember that. But you gushed forth in water from your mother's womb. That was your natural birth. You were born like your old man, Adam. And then one day somebody told you the good news. You were dead. You were dead in your sin. 
And then somebody told you the good news of the gospel and you said yes to Jesus. You took your faith and you said yes to Jesus. And when you did that, according to Romans chapter 6, you were baptized into Jesus. The Bible says the Holy Spirit took you and he put you in Jesus. When I was a little younger, I'd throw myself down on the ground and act like I was dead. The old man born of Adam has died, and a new man has been resurrected to new life. Right. The old has passed away. The new has come. Yes. This is what the Bible teaches about your new birth in Christ. In God's mind, when you said yes to Jesus, whether you understood it or not, if you meant business with God, your old man died, was buried with Jesus in the tomb, and a new man has been resurrected to newness of life and has a new power source yeah. of pneumatics. <laughs> you got a pneumatic engine on the inside of you. It's the pneumaticos, it's the new man, it's the Holy Spirit living in you. And he wants to give you the strength that you need in order to live for him. So he goes on to say this, verse Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That's the truth of the Bible right there. You hung in God's mind, when you got saved, in God's mind, he hit the rewind button. 2,000 years. And now he sees you in Jesus on the cross. Fast forward a little bit. He sees you in Jesus in the tomb. Fast forward three days. He sees you resurrected in Jesus. And now he lives in you. Amen. And he wants to give you strength. Hallelujah. Singers, musicians, you can come forward. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory and honor. We thank you for this beautiful plan, how you change people's lives. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's one last scripture. Why don't you put this up there real quick, Sandy? It's Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says this. I like this scripture. Look, if ye then be risen with Christ. If ye then be risen with Christ. If this is true, what I just read you in Romans 6. If it's true that you're truly risen in Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. Amen. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to encourage you to know the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. The Bible says that there's multitudes that are in the valley of decision. And that today is the day. And that I want to encourage you to know that you can receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, right here, right now. And it's as simple as inviting him into your heart and asking him to have his way with you. I want you to know that the altars are open. Amen. As they begin to praise and as they begin to lead us in a couple of songs of worship, praise God. If you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit moving on your heart and you feel as though you need prayer, I want you to know that we have people that would love to pray with you. We love to pray with people. Amen. I don't want you to have to leave this place this morning. I'm not trying to coerce anybody into just coming to the front. That's not what's important to me. What's important for me is that you give your heart to Christ. That you invite him into your heart. But many times helping to lead someone in a prayer helps them to understand how to receive Christ. Matter of fact, why don't we just stop right now, right now? Why don't you stand to your feet? Stand to your feet.
into my heart right now, Lord Jesus. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, Lord. Oh, I ask you, Lord God, to teach me your ways. Give me a hunger for your word, Lord. I'm just going to pray for you right now in the name of Jesus. You see the hearts of these people, Lord. You see the ones that received you, Lord. You see the ones that prayed and invited you into their heart. Holy Spirit, I pray even right now as we begin to sing this song, that they would begin to feel your presence, Lord. That you would begin to bring healing and hope, Lord, on the inside. And Lord, if you want them to be praying for God, I pray that you would draw them to these altars, oh Lord God, in Jesus' name. 